Maybe you don't sign on for the slogan, tax the rich, but what about tax the super rich? It's an idea that's popped up in the last Canadian federal election campaign and that is certainly making the rounds south of the border. Joining us now to consider the merits of such a wealth tax. Brett House, he's Vice President, Deputy Chief Economist at Scotiabank and a Senior Fellow at Massey College. And Tavaki Thevaratnam, Director of Research and Education at the Ontario Federation of Labour. And Brett, it's nice to welcome you back to our program. Tavaki, nice to welcome you Thank here for the first you. time. Great. Let's put some bullet points on the table just to help set up this discussion here. And we will ask the talented Sheldon Osmond to flick a switch and there it comes. Okay. According to the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, the wealthiest 87 families in Canada, 87 families, own as much wealth as the bottom 12 million Canadians. In this past federal election campaign, the NDP proposed a wealth tax of 1% on families with assets of more than $20 million, which would include about 6,000 families. And one last thing, what do Canadians think about a wealth tax? Abacus Data did a survey and found that 67% of Canadians support or somewhat support a wealth tax, including 58% of Canadians identifying as right-wing. They self-identify as right-wing and 58% say we're up for a wealth tax. I guess the first thing we should do before we sort of figure out whether we're for or again this thing is to figure out what exactly it is. So, Tavaki, do you want to give us... Give us the handy dandy definition of when you talk wealth tax, what are you referring to? So when we're talking about a wealth tax, we're looking at the net worth of people's assets. So it's essentially your assets minus your liabilities. Now, most of us pay income taxes, and what that looks like is a tax on your employment income. For the super rich, they also pay income taxes as well, but that's actually the tax that they pay on their capital gains. So, for example, if you're selling a stock in the stock market, that profit is taxed. Now the difference is, if I was to earn that exact same money as an, like during my working hours, that's taxed. That is 100% taxable. Mm -hmm. Now the profit that you sell, the profit that you gain from a stock, only 50% of that is taxable. So that's where we're seeing a lot of wealth accumulate. And more so, Canada doesn't actually have an inheritance tax. So you're seeing wealth accumulate over generations as that wealth is passed down. And so that's where you accumulate a lot of that wealth. Okay. So that's when, more, when Warren Buffett says, I actually pay a lower tax rate than my secretary, that's what he means. Exactly. Because she's, she's paying tax on her employment income and he's paying tax on his capital gains. Exactly. Okay. What's the goal of a wealth tax? Well, I would suggest that there are probably three main goals. One being taxes in general. What they do is they fund the public services that we all use and we all should be contributing towards. Now, public services like our education system, our health care, um, public infrastructure. But imagine what a wealth tax could produce in new revenue. We could be funding universal pharmacare, universal dental care, and national child care strategy. Because you're convinced the wealth tax would bring in so much more revenue. Exactly, exactly. Okay, what's um, number two? Number two would be wealth inequality. Wealth so, inequality? So, as okay. you mentioned, 87 families in this country own as much as people living in Newfoundland and Labrador, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick combined. And that's a question of what we want to see in society, whether that is a reflection of our values. Third point? Third point is, consider that when you have more wealth, you exude more power, particularly political power. So when we're talking about political power, these are folks that are able to control our media narratives. These are folks that are able to have direct access to government through lobbying, that are able to influence policy think tanks. And by doing so, they're able to perpetuate and uphold their privilege. And so it's a question of whether or not our democracy is actually being diminished in this way. And so I believe a wealth tax would redistribute democratic power in that way as well. So financial and democratic reasons, Brett, why uh in Tabaki's view, we ought to have a wealth tax. Let's get your side of things. What do you say? Well, I think the question that you posed, what is the point of a wealth tax, is an important one to keep in mind. Because when this conversation gets started in Canada, I think in many ways we're bringing in a debate from outside the country, from the United States, and other places that maybe isn't quite as relevant here. If we look at measures of inequality on the income front in Canada. Canada does very well. Uh, our inequality is relatively low compared with most other industrialized countries. And that's in part because our tax system is already fairly redistributive in terms of moving resources from relatively high income earners to relatively low income earners. So you know, the initial question of what is a wealth tax meant to do 
In many ways, we're already dealing with that through our tax system and through further improvements in the tax system, you know, that could be uh, dealt with even more deeply. On the second front, will a wealth tax do indeed in a practical way what it's being asked to do? I think that's really questionable. Most countries that have had wealth taxes have removed them over the last 15 years or so because in practice, they tend not to actually garner anything close to the estimates of what their proposers or initiators thought they would bring in in terms of tax revenue. And why is that? Uh, largely because the valuation issue on the assets and liabilities for someone is really tough to do. If you're looking at houses, art, other things that people own, you know, those things are very market contingent. They're very appraiser contingent. And there's also an incentive when you put a wealth tax into place for people to take out more debt to offset it. And that may be helpful in terms of getting resources back into the economy and investment productively deployed in the economy, but it also might make an economy more vulnerable to financial uh, crisis or financial uncertainty as well. Okay. Let's come back to that and we'll go a little deeper on that later. What about the argument that Tavaki brought forward which suggests that the more money you have, the more political power you have, and, 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 and there should be a way in Canada, which is a more egalitarian society than the United States, to, to kind of bevel the edges of those who have so much political power? Well, you know, I think we already do that in many ways. You know, we have created limits on political spending and political donations in this country that are actually pretty tight compared with the rest of the world. And when you look at what it costs to fund a campaign for a seat in Parliament right now, it's about a tenth or less of what it costs in the United States. And, you know, that's not just a factor of our population being smaller. It really is a factor of those limits being very effective. Now, that's not the only way political power gets expressed. Uh, but we have things that counteract private interests with things like TVO, you know, that provide an alternative to private media outlets. So I think we have created a situation where we have a number of checks and balances and alternative voices that do counteract the particular voice that comes along with having economic power. Tabeki, it is a fact that, that the Mike Bloomberg effect that we're seeing in the United States right now, where a billionaire enters the race at the 11th hour, just decides that he's going to, you know, obliterate his opponents by outspending them. You can't do that here. We do have strict limits in place. So does that chip away at your argument at all? I don't believe so, because you're able to actually, through the legislation that we have, have third-body advertising. And that's actually a bunch of different groups, powerful groups, that are able to construct a narrative and, through advertising, put that out there to the public, whether that be on Facebook or YouTube or other avenues. So you're still able, there are loopholes in that legislation that still allow money to enter into politics. Okay, let me put another point to you, which is the notion that the rich always find a way to, legally they would say, not evade, but avoid paying more tax by being clever, whatever. They're sure. going to move money to the Cayman Islands, they're going to hire accountants to figure out every loophole in the book. So even if you do manage to bring this wealth tax forward, it won't realize the amount of income that you think it will. You want to speak to that? Absolutely. Like, you're absolutely right that the wealthy have resources that most of us don't, and they're able to pay their lawyers and accountants to give them the answers that they want. But at the end of the day, we have to ultimately ask, like the PBO, for example, looked at the NDP's proposal. Parliamentary Budget Office. Yes. And they found that about a th uh, third of that money might be evaded. Now, uh, folks in the states that have been behind Elizabeth Warren's proposal, Gabrielle Zuckman and Emmanuel Saez, who are also big proponents of, wealth and, uh, of reducing wealth inequality, have found that if you construct a well-designed, well-enforced tax system, that evasion drops to about 16%. And so, yes, there's going to be evasion, but we have to look at the cost and benefit analysis as well. And the benefits far outweigh the cost, ultimately. So at the end of the day, maybe it's worth doing? Well, I think, you know, an equity issue was brought up right at the beginning. And a wealth tax implicitly uh, asserts that we're going to tax the same income more than once. When, when capital has been accumulated by people, it's a result of you know, successful decisions. It may be a result of inheritance or it may be a result of good luck. Uh, but it does reflect income that's already been taxed once around. And we generally have a presumption in our tax system that we don't tax the same income two times or even multiple times. So I think you know, there are multiple equity issues and fairness issues that need to be taken into account here. And that also has to be set against this issue of trying to you know, redistribute wealth and income in the society. If our tax system isn't working well right now, whether it's on the political donation or third party advertising front, or on loopholes existing, I would say let's focus on closing those loopholes 
and designing the tax system more effectively. We've had repeated calls in Canada for decades to look afresh at the tax system, to make it as efficient and as effective as possible. And no politician will go near it because they're terrified too. No one will go near it, but you know the chances of someone actually taking that on get greater to the extent that we build a coalition of voices from across the country and across different sectors of the economy seeking that kind of refresh and relook to ensure that our tax system corresponds to our 21st century needs. And one of the biggest needs I think we have to keep in mind is that Canada is traditionally a capital poor economy. We're a small population on a very big landmass, and to develop, we have always needed to bring capital in from abroad if we want to ensure that our tax system continues to incentivize that rather than pushes it away. So your concern is a wealth tax would, would have a chilling effect on money coming into the country and investing here? It absolutely could. You want to speak to that? Uh, actually, I can I speak to a point that Brett made earlier? The, which one? The double taxation one? Uh, no, to the point about billion. So I needed to, I wanted to clarify, we're talking about a wealth tax, but this mm -hmm. is on those that have like a high, high wealth amount. So if the NDP is proposing 20 million, Elizabeth Warren is proposing 50 million as a mm -hmm. threshold. But I want to make it clear that billionaires don't exist on their own. They have access public infrastructure over the years. They have accessed workers that are being educated in our public school systems. They are accessing robust economic markets that the government has put forth or helped incentivize and create. So to suggest that billionaires have created that wealth through inheritance or luck or opportunity, absolutely, there's hard work that goes into it. But there's also the aspect that they have accessed those public services and it's time for those folks to actually pay their fair share and to reinvest. They and do to, pay taxes now. No, of yes. course, but it's yeah. a question of do they pay their fair share? You taxes. say no, he it, says yes. Exactly. Yeah, and I would and say, you know, in many cases for much of Canada's history, income taxes for the highest tax bracket have implied a marginal tax rate of more than 50%. So, you know, they've been paying reasonable taxes on their income for a substantial period of time. I'm not going to defend a, or defend a particular group of taxpayers, but I think you can reasonably say that there's been a public consensus in Canada that, unlike the Thatcher era in the UK when she famously asserted society doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Taxpayers across the income spectrum have bought into the notion that we do well when our entire society does well, and our entire society does well when public services function well. Let the, can we just talk about the public relations of this for, for the moment? Because, you know, from 30,000 feet up, it looks like she's defending people who don't have very much, and it looks like you're defending people who have a hell of a lot. Do you, are you in a tougher spot right here to try to make an argument that we should lay off billionaires? You know, that's not the case that I'm making here at all. What I am making a case for is a well-designed tax system that taxes fairly across the entire range of incomes that are being treated and assets that are being treated. And that will actually ensure that the rhetoric we build around that tax system and the promises that we labor on top of it are actually met. You know, it's not going to do us any good to implement something that actually in the end will not produce the kind of revenue that we anticipate that we would. And you know, secondly, then leaves us in a situation where spending and revenue are mismatched and we're actually pushing or dissuading capital from coming into the country. Could we say, Tavaki, that, that um, your intentions are good, but when the rubber hits the road, rich people will leave. Rich people will figure out a way to husband their resources in such a way to keep them away from Revenue Canada. They will figure this out. So even though you got, you know, you may, your heart may be in the right place, the reality is it's not going to work. Is that possible? I don't believe so because mm -hmm. I think what we're accepting the premise is that people come to Canada, stay in Canada for the money, for the tax system. And I don't think that's true. There's some aspect of it that may be true, but largely people have struggled to come into this country. People have stayed in this country for the personal connections, for the community they've built, for the values that Canada holds, for the country that it is. And so to simply say that if there was a wealth tax on the uber rich, that they would suddenly leave, I don't think so. And let's talk about the fact that we're talking about assets as well. You can't just pick up a factory or land and simply move. And if you choose to, well, that capital still remains in this country and still gets used. And Elizabeth Warren's plan actually addresses this policy by um, introducing an exit tax. And that exit tax is like a 40% tax on folks that have a net worth of $50 million that choose to renounce their American citizenship. And so there are avenues to actually counter this idea of folks leaving the country. 
And, you know, I'd just like to say, I think we're really importing an American debate here that is a bit at odds with the facts on where the economy and where our tax system stands in Canada. You know, we, we are looking here at the question of, you know, do we bring in a wealth tax or not because there might be evasion? I don't think that's the right question at all. And I really agree with the comments you made. You know, people who might be affected by a wealth tax are not about to flee and give up their commitment to the society simply because a tax has brought, been brought into place. We've seen consistently over time uh, that even when tax rates were marginally much higher in Canada than elsewhere, that people stayed because of their commitment to the society. The bigger issue is the chill on which it would place uh, on potential capital coming into the country. And you know, investment decisions being made outside the country going forward. I appreciate that, Brett, but yeah. the, the, I, mean, I think the two of you would agree that there is income inequality in, in our society. Absolutely. And the question is how much, how much is acceptable in what still feels like a free and democratic and equitable and sensible society? Well, you know, on that point, there's some really great work that Miles Chorak has done, who is a Canadian researcher who was formerly located here on uh, income inequality and income mobility across generations. And you know the punchline from all that research is that the American dream still lives in Canada, mm -hmm. in fact. And so it looks at the correlation between three generations of incomes in the same family. And so you know, if the grandparents' generation is closely correlated with the grandkids' generation in terms of income, then you've had very little mobility within the society. And it could be up or down. And Canada has much less correlation across those three generations than in the United States. And what it implies is that you've got opportunity, you've got the possibility of earning much more than your grandparents here to a much greater likelihood than is the case in the US. And that applies in Belgium, the Netherlands, the uh, Nordic countries and Australia as well. So we... I think we're doing all right on the income inequality front. But can we look at the bottom half of folks in this country, especially in this province? There are people that can't access housing, housing sorry, let alone affordable housing. There are people that are making decisions on whether or not they can afford their prescription drugs just because they can't make ends meet. There are folks that are working multiple precarious jobs and poor working conditions. Would a wealth tax change any of that? Well, it's the redistribution of income. And so, or wealth, sorry. And so you're seeing government being able to access new revenues that they haven't before. Often government is focused on one side of the balance sheet, which is cutting the, uh, cutting spending, or sorry, the income statement. But they're never really focused on how do we generate more revenue, consistent revenue. And so this wealth tax actually allows for that. So, but let's, let's look at people on the other end of the spectrum, because their realities are much, much harsher than we're giving them credit for. This is the life that they lead. This is their lived experience. And let's talk about marginalized communities and apply an equity focus to what those folks are going through. Yeah, I think that's exactly the right place to put our concern. No question whatsoever. But I think rather than getting distracted by the wealth tax debate in the United States, let's focus on the policy measures we can take in Canada that will directly address those problems. So, you know, on housing affordability, when we look at that in Toronto and Vancouver, to me, the thing that we need to act on there is getting supply up, not on you know second order or third order issues. You know, they're somewhat detached from it on you know the tax system. If we got supply up in Toronto and Vancouver, we would deal with those affordability issues much more directly than through something like a wealth tax. Well, let's try this. If you wanted to do uh, a universal basic income yep. across the country, you gotta find 45 to 50 billion dollars. You want to do pharmacare across the country, you gotta find 15 billion dollars. Would a wealth tax get you some of the way towards that? You know, based on the experience of the European countries that have had wealth taxes, probably not. It wouldn't take you very far, and it would possibly dent growth going forward because of the chill on capital. Okay, Tavaki, i got to put that to you, because sure. apparently three decades ago, 12 European countries had a wealth tax. Today, there are basically three that mm -hmm. levy a broad wealth tax, Norway, Switzerland, Spain. This suggests that the idea has been tried, found wanting, and therefore there are very few people doing it anymore. Is that instructive to you? Sure. So I would uh, I would think of this question in two ways. One, let's look at the specific case in the European Union, mm -hmm. and let's look at the generality around the wealth tax. So in terms of the countries that uh, levied a wealth tax in the EU, one of the differences, it's so much easier to move around within the European Union and escape your taxes. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in the US or in Canada. Taxes are still levied on citizens, whether they are working here or working abroad. So that's one aspect that's different. Another aspect is the wealth tax, uh, the wealth uh, amount, that threshold has changed as well. So in the European Union, 
in different countries, it was actually much lower than is what is being proposed by the NDP and south of the border as well. And so what you're seeing is that, or what they saw, was you were kind of hitting the people that had family businesses but didn't have the income, the cash, to pay the taxes. I mean, that is one of the concerns here, is that there were some farmers that were getting... You right, know, swooped so what, up in this thing because their land had suddenly appreciated mm -hmm. in value, and suddenly they were rich enough to be hit with a wealth tax. Absolutely. So we're, it's so important that that uh, threshold, that wealth threshold, is set properly and set high enough that we're hitting those billionaires or those hundreds of millions of dollars of millionaires. <laughs> so that's why we need to be cognizant of that threshold. I'd also argue that, um, as Brett mentioned before, there were exemptions. So what your, some of the countries in the European Union did is that they exempted art and antiques because they found them hard to uh, value. Mm -hmm. So what did folks do? They bought a bunch of antiques and artwork. And so when you have exemptions like that, so Elizabeth Warren's plan, for example, does not have any exemptions. So that counters that. We got a minute left. Do you worry you're on the wrong side of this argument in as much as we do hear billionaires like Warren Buffett and George Soros say it's time for a wealth tax? The reason they're saying that is because the tax system in the United States is not working efficiently and effectively on the taxation of income. And so, you know, one of the clearest ways to ensure we don't sweep small business owners, farm owners, other people who actually wouldn't have the liquid income to pay a wealth tax and would be unfairly hit by one, the clearest way to avoid doing that is to tax income properly rather than trying to tax assets in the way the wealth tax proposes. So, you know, I think what we need to do is focus on fixing the tax system that we've got, ensuring we spend more effectively than we do now, using the resources we have at our disposal more effectively. Let me save 20 seconds for you to ask whether or not you think a liberal government supported by a new democratic balance of power in the current minority parliament might bring this in. I would very much hope so. I think it's an excellent opportunity to reduce wealth inequality in this country. Um, it's all about political will. Ultimately, governments make choices. They make choices about where they want to invest and who they want to invest for. Mm -hmm. Are they investing for the 99% of us or are they investing for the 1%? I want to thank both of you for coming into TVO tonight and having this debate. Brad House from Scotiabank, Tavaki Thevaratnam from the Ontario Federation of Labour. Thanks to you both. Thank, thank you, you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.